Ready for the word of God this evening. Amen. Amen. Sister Kathy's going to share with us tonight. Do you want to go down? No, down. I can do it without the flag being on the floor. Oh, good job.
Use your outdoor voice to be on the side. Okay. I promise I won't get it like a cat. Thank you, Lord, for your sweet peace in this place tonight and okay. your presence. We just praise your holy name. We thank you for your word. We thank you. What is man that you are even mindful of us? We thank you, Lord, for all that you have done for us. Lord, lead me and guide me tonight. And help us to obey the word that we're about to hear. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So, we've been working through John 14, and now we're getting John 15. <clears throat> and we are having a class before this where they were taking a spiritual assessment test, and so my throat is... <clears throat> but, I read 183 questions. However, in John 13... Jesus was still being seen as a military messiah by some of his disciples. And at the Last Supper, Jesus, who's supposed to, in their eyes, be this great military leader, turns around and washes their feet. That's what servant, the lowest of servants would do when you came in the house. The lowest of servants would wash the people's feet that came in. In, and Jesus was washing his disciples' feet. <clears throat> that probably set them a little on edge. <laughs> and we know, just, just a little bit, you know, that you're not supposed to do this. You're the Messiah. You know, and Peter objected. And that's probably why. And he said this in John 13, 14, and for those of you who are visiting, I don't do the scripture reading because I lose my voice. So anyone who wants to read is fine. Can someone read John 13, 14, please? Now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also should wash one another's feet. That's probably something they didn't want to hear. And then he tells them one disciple is going to betray them. And then he tells them that he's going away. Enter the confusion and flipping out. Yeah. Which is a 60s term for being really nervous and upset. Yeah. <laughs> so in John 14, he starts to prepare the disciples for continuing the ministry after he's gone. And there's that back and forth conversation where they're just not getting it. And they're like, well, where are you going? Why can't I come too? Back and forth with all these different things. And he's trying to get them to focus. But when you're confused and when you're afraid, when you're flipping out, it's really hard to focus because your mind is still thinking the really fearful thoughts. And so Jesus is just trying, okay, everybody, let's, let's get centered here on what I'm saying. And so he addressed his going away by using the imagery of a Jewish wedding. Although he's going away, just like in a Jewish betrothal, he is calling them to commitment to him as he will return to take them to himself someday. And then Jesus defines love this way. Obey my commands. And he calls his disciples to love one another as he has loved them. It's a sacrificial type of love that he's trying to get them to focus in on when they're afraid. And then he said, when he goes away, the Holy Spirit, the advocate, the helper, the counselor, the spirit of truth will come. And now we're at John 15, we're only going to go, we're going to read 1 through 8 for context, but we're probably only going to get through 4. 
tonight. Would someone read John 15, 1 through 8? I am the true vine, and my father is the gardener. Welcome. <laughs> he cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit out, while every branch that does not, that does bear fruit, he prunes so that it will be even more fruitful. You are already clean because the word I have spoken to you. <coughs> remain in me as I also remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither Oops. do I know the rest of that verse by heart. <laughs> I'm so sorry. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me, and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. If you do not remain in me, you are like a branch that is thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up, thrown into the fire, and burned. If you remain in me, and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. This is to my Father's glory that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. Amen. Thank you. So we have the imagery of the wedding in John 14, and now he's doing the imagery of a vineyard, something that they understand, something that, that he could drive it home. He's going deeper with them on being totally committed to himself. In verse 1 and 2 it says, I am the true vine and my father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit, while every branch that does bear fruit he prunes so that it will be even more fruitful. Jesus is the true vine. But there's many things out there that call for our attention constantly. Brother Todd talked about it yesterday. What did you call the internet? And the <laughs> I know. The internet. The, the, the internet. The, the, inter the internet. internet. And what was the other internet one? Sucks, okay, yeah. Google. Oh, Google and the internet, yes. <laughs> Google. <laughs> now you'd be staying captive and you'd be in there for days and hours. Yeah, Just, yeah. I was on this corner to check my email. Five hours later, you're still on it. <laughs> yep, yeah. It, it's a, it's a, it's a big distraction. It's yeah. not the true vine. You it's know, not yeah. where we should be placing our attention. Amen. Jesus is the true vine. Yes. No. But there are other things that buy for our attention as well. Relationships. Um, children. Children. <laughs> and believe it or not, we have to work. <laughs> oh, gosh. <really? laughs> yeah. Yep. Well, there's a balance to that, too. Um, my son started a new job, and the boss was trying to push him into working on Sunday, and you know Andrew. Andrew leaned forward, and he said, I said, I am not working on Sunday. And you understood that when, when you hired me. Oh, yeah, but in case we, I am not working on Sunday. So, I think they heard him. That, that's his mother's part right there, because when my kids used to mess up, I'd go, I said. <laughs> so now he's doing it. But we've got to be careful. And paying the bills, I mean, yes, you've got to pay the bills, but it's not really up to you to pay the bills. It's up to God to pay the bills. You just do what he tells you and go to work. And then he will provide for your needs. But it's true that once we get stuff, we want more stuff, and we want better stuff, and then we get into Google and internet, <laughs> and that's the wrong buying people. Yeah, There's the Amazon. And then you get yeah, stuck. Yeah, Amazon. <laughs> you're stuck in the Google. <laughs> yes, you're stuck in the Google. Yes. Yeah, yeah, cool. yeah. Exactly. And. All the while, Jesus 
is the true vine. That's where our focus needs to be. That is where our life centers from. And it, it's a lot easier now that I'm a senior citizen because when you're a senior citizen, you know, if you go out wearing a polka dotted shirt and striped pants because you like them, you just don't care what people think anymore. <laughs> but there are people who are really caught up in what people think, and that's another false vine. You know, do, yeah, try. Um, I try to tell my kids this um, that I have learned to seek first the kingdom, and all will be given. And all will be given to you, you know, because, like, we can seek the world and miss God, but we seek God, everything in the world will come to us within proportions of, of his will for it, you know? Amen. It's seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, but the American church goes, oh, and all these things will be added unto you, goody, goody things. Yeah, they jump over. Uh, no, 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 no. <laughs> seek ye first the kingdom of God. That means put him first. <laughs> seek his kingdom first. Yeah. Do his will first. Amen. Do the mission that he's called you to first. Amen. And all these other things are like, yeah, and all these other things. I don't have to worry about them because if I do what God wants, he'll take care of me. Yeah, you go. But, but that doesn't mean that, you know, we're going to get the best computer or the best car or the best house. Not unless you plan on um, your gift is hospitality and you're going to have a lot of people living with you. So you mean it, the more I work for the Lord, the more he's going to give me? Yeah. Is, that, is that what it is? No. I think the more we is focus. Faith with works or just works and that's it? He'll, he'll give you whatever you need. Yeah. Yeah. The yeah. more we focus, the less we want that stuff. That's right. Amen. Right. There is, I, one pastor has said, God will give you, will provide for all your needs, but he will not provide for all your greed. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Amen. Be like a black hole trying to suck in everything. Yeah. <laughs> and then suddenly you find that you're attached to the wrong time. Because Ouch. it becomes an idol. So, back to the fruit part. Jesus is the true vine, and there are many things that call for our attention. Jesus, though, is the way, the truth, and the life. But what is this fruit he's talking about? Someone read Colossians 1, 9 through 11. For this reason, since the day we heard about you, we have not stopped praying for you. We continue to ask God to fill you with the knowledge of his will through all the wisdom and understanding that the Spirit gives. So that you may live a life worthy of the Lord and please him in every way, bearing fruit in every good work, growing in the knowledge of God, being strengthened with all power according to his glorious might, so that you may have great endurance and patience. Amen. We may live a life worthy of the Lord and please him in every way, bearing fruit in every way good work. Now, yes, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, self-control. When I was teaching at a residential school, I that's how I would tell them about my students I was not pleased. I'd start to go, love, joy, peace. And if I got to patience, some of my students would go, everybody shut up. She got to patience. <laughs> Because they were going to lose points. <laughs> and yes, it's true that that is also fruit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness. But you really can't develop that fruit without doing the works that God has called you to do. Notice I say the works that God has called you to do. We don't get to pick and choose what we do. I know a lot of people that think that if they give a lot of money to the homeless, that, you know, God is, is, is going to get them into heaven. No, it doesn't work that way. I'm sorry. 
You do what God tells you to do, and then you're just his servant doing what you're supposed to do. So, let's read Ephesians 2.10. What works are we supposed to do? For we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. Which God prepared in advance for us to do. We don't have to worry what it is I'm supposed to be doing. God knows. He's already prepared it in advance, and we walk in it. We walk in it. Is it easy? Uh, no. Well, we walk in it, and that's how we get that lovely fruit of love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, self control. Because doing this work is a blessing, but it's oftentimes not easy. But those are the good works, those are the things that produce fruit. Later on, we find out fruit that remains. Because when we do what God tells us to do, then he's going to bless it. He's going to help us to grow in it. But if we refuse to do the works that God has already prepared for us to do, then it says we're a dead vine. I don't want to be a dead vine. It's real ugly. It's not God's choice for us. Dead vines are dried out. And he cuts them off. Yeah. We don't want to, you know, but those of us whose parents told us we have a stubborn streak, me, you know, we want to do it our way or the highway, and God is patiently waiting, saying, anytime you're ready, you know, it's here for you. And that's not just for people who are of adult age. That is for, I mean, Samuel was how old? David was a teen. Mary was a teen. It's for everybody. For everybody. And what about the pruning? One of my favorite authors is Andrew Murray. Linda and I were just talking on the way over about how in the 1800s they actually knew how to write. <laughs> you know, man, I tell you, this guy, it's amazing. You can just hear, you can just feel the relationship that he has with Jesus when you read Andrew Murray's books. This is what he has to say about pruning. Consider a moment what this pruning or cleansing is. It's not the removal of weeds or thorns or anything from without that may hinder growth. No, it's the cutting off of the long shoots of the previous year, the removal of something that comes from within that has been produced by the life of the vine itself. It is the removal of something that is proof of the vigor of its life, the more vigorous the growth has been, the greater the need of pruning. Thank you so much. <laughs> it is the honest, healthy wood of the vine that has to be cut away. And why? Because it would consume too much of the sap to fill all the long shoots of the last year's growth. The sap must be saved up and used for the fruit alone. The branches, sometimes eight and ten feet long, are cut down close to the stem, and nothing is left but just one or two inches of wood, enough to bear the grapes. It is when everything that is not needful for fruit bearing has been relentlessly cut down, and just as little of the branches as possible has been left, that a full, rich fruit may be expected. What a solemn, precious lesson. And while it's certainly true that God needs to remove the sin in our life, it's so true, it's also true that as we grow in him, that God needs to remove areas in our lives that may be 
good for other people, but are not God's best for us. I have a Christian friend who has the gift of evangelism, a heart for missions. She is the maddest networker that I have ever seen in my life. A heart for worship, the gift of encouragement, a heart for those downtrodden and abused, a heart for the younger generation. She wanted to do it all for the Lord, all of it, and she tried that. Her branch was growing all over the place. But there was a problem. She found that she could only do all of it somewhat adequately. God had to prune away some of the things that she was doing so that she could focus on what he actually called her to do. She's the type of person that if there was a gap and no one was jumping up right now to fill it, she would jump right up now and fill it. The problem with that is... Not everyone jumps up like her and fills things. They're a little bit shy at first when they're entering into doing something for God. And you can't just jump up and snap and do something because somebody else may be the one that's supposed to be doing that right now. But she would just, oh, this needs to be done. I'll do this. Yes, ma'am. Well, sometimes, too, we do a lot of things and we think it's for the Lord. And sometimes the enemy wants to weigh you down so then you're not effective in what you're supposed to do. Exactly right. Mm -hmm. Exactly right. Yep. And you should say the same. I think that's right. Um, sometimes the Lord do things that we can't do. So sometimes it's a blessing when they come in your life. And it's a blessing when they leave, it, leave your life. Sometimes we have, we have that problem separating ourselves from um, toxic people or whatever like that. And we're like, how am I going to do this? So we pray, right? And the Lord does things for us that we can't do ourselves because we don't want to hurt them or not. So the Lord, with the fruits of the Spirit, does it in a way that they won't be hurt and you won't be hurt. And y'all can still remain like, love you from a distance. I still love you, but I love you from a distance type of thing. You know? It's called someone else is called with the gifts to minister to that person to get them to steer in the right direction. Yeah. So, you know, when she did actually get rid of like four things that she was doing, then God opened the door miraculously for her to do what she's been called to do. And she has done what God has called her to do exceptionally well. It has been amazing. And she has not only learned the art of casting off the things that God didn't call her to do, but she also saw other people with the same calling and allowed them to use their gifts and talents to come alongside her and help. We were doing a, a spiritual gifts assessment earlier, and we find that with the test, you know those tests, they're, they're only an overview, they're not forever, but it tells you that your highest gifts when you test out, you do those 80% of the time. Then the next couple, you do 20% of the time. The rest, you delegate. As leaders, we don't have to be able to do it all. Because if we try to do it all as leaders, then the rest of the people don't get to grow in their gifts. And sometimes it's really hard, especially if you have the gift of administration and the gift of leadership and organization and they don't do it quite the way you would do it and you just have to step back and just let them go and then you find out oh wow they did it better than me because that's not really my gift anyway okay god the next time they get this so you know we may have the gift of leadership but our administration skills are um they could be better. And we might 
I have the gift of leadership, but our rhythmic and vocal skills would um, be a hindrance to leading worship. So let the other branches with those gifts do that. Debbie. What I really love about the first time, I can kind of remember even the first time I read this Ephesians 2.10, the reason it's so beautiful is because it says, which God had prepared in advance for That's us to right. do. So boy, you know, it's pretty hard not to feel special if you read that sentence correctly. You're just special. Because God, it's like, you know, you know when you're going to have a wedding and they roll out the carpet in front of the bride <laughs> and the bride comes walking down on whatever that is. And, and we are the bride of Christ. And he did roll out a carpet of, uh, of gifts for us to, to do. But um, it's not even just about um, are we doing good, you know, does our good outweigh our bad. It just, it's just beautiful. You know, God really loves us. Amen. And he prepared a way for all of us. That's right. And so we don't have to worry about, oh, God's called me. What if I blow this? Well, no, he's prepared mm. already. All we have to do mm. is do what he tells us. It's when we do what we want to do that things get messed up. You know, that verse right there, God prepared in advance, right? It takes pride right out the way. Yeah, yeah. Because so much <laughs> of us fight for certain positions and everything like that. And if we really fully understand that verse right there, he's prepared it. So that means we don't have to fight and argue about nothing. God already prepared it. So you would know that you know that you know that you're called for that position right there. And you don't have to fight. Just be patient. That's right. That's right. And I, I grew up in a church that wasn't saved. Um, I went with my neighbor because my parents were what they call home Baptists. And because my mother's best friend it was like, you really, you know, 50s and 60s, you really need to go to church. She needs to go to church. So I went. But talk about vying for position. I mean, ever been in a church that's all about committees where you can't even sneeze because you have to decide what type of tissue the committee is going to do? That's the type of church I went to. And it was all about them and all of that and, and people trying to take each other's position. And, and I, I was kind of like, this is church? And then I came to know Jesus and I learned this verse and it's like, you know what? You know, he's called me to do this, but it might not be right now. Right now he's trying to lead someone else in this position. And when the time comes, that it will be my turn. And may I do it to your glory, God. Like Todd said, when you know it's prepared in advance, it takes the pride right out of it. Amen. Humble yourself before the Lord, and in due time, he will exalt you. Amen. To your rightful position. If you're seeking first the kingdom of God, you don't have to jockey for a position. That's right. And that's flesh anyway, and that's not going to last, and there's no anointing, and it's not going to touch nobody but Amen. yourself. Amen. Well, like Todd said, what shall it profit a man to gain all the goo 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 <laughs> and lose his own soul? <laughs> okay, now this is being recorded, ladies and gentlemen. That's another way to look at it. Duct tape. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Stick to God oh, like glue. Okay, we're coming back now. We're coming back. We're coming back. All right. So then Jesus says, it's like, he said, oh, I forgot to tell you this. At least that's the way it is in the English translation, but when you look in the Greek, it flows. In the English it says, you are already clean because of the word I have spoken to you. What we're talking about vines. Now we're taking baths. What's going on here? <laughs> and but the word for prune in verse two and clean in verse three are from the same root word. One is a verb and one is an adjective. Don't ask me to pronounce them. I tried to listen on Blue Letter Bible and I cannot roll the R's. I'm sorry. <laughs> But the prune, one that we translate prune, 
also means cleanse, prune, purge, depending upon the context. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the other one is clean and pure in a ritualistic cleansing, but that's not the context here. Or as a vine is cleansed by pruning and so fitted to bear fruit. So he hasn't done a sidebar. I forgot to tell you this. It's all the same. It's all the same. He's saying, I've already started pruning you. I've already started pruning you. And what's the pruning knife? Could someone read Hebrews 4.12? For the word of God is alive and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to the dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. Amen. Mm. For those of you who know Marsha Martin, this is one of her favorite verses. She can pop it off like that. She went to Faith Bible College in Maine back when it was still going, and they made them memorize scripture like you wouldn't believe. She can pop off like a hundred of them. Boom, 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 boom. But this is her favorite verse, one of them. The word of God is alive and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to the dividing souls and spirit, joints and marrows. It judges the thoughts and attitude of the heart. Ever been convicted when you read the word? <laughs> mm. that, that's that pruning knife. That's that pruning knife. There, there's some people, actually, that are afraid to read the word sometimes because they know they're not doing right, and if they go and read that word, they're just going to get back. <laughs> but, hey, I've been there. I've been there. But that is the pruning knife. God's word is the pruning knife. Jesus said they're already pruned by the word he has spoken to them. And then he says, this in John 15, 4. Someone read it, please. Remain in me as I also remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. Remember, they're freaking out. He said that he's going away, and they're like, what on earth, what on earth? And he's still trying to say, Follow me, be committed to me, remain in me. What a foolish thought to think that a branch can just hop off and say, hey, I'm going to go over here now, see ya. The word remain means to abide, continue, dwell, endure, be present, stand, and tarry for. But Andrew Murray explains this much when a new graft is placed in a vine and it abides there, a twofold process takes place. The first is in the wood. The graft shoots its little roots and fibers down into the stem, and the stem grows up into the graft in what has been called the structural union that is affected. The graft abides and becomes one with the vine. That is abide in me. He has prepared for you an abiding dwelling with himself where your whole life and every moment of it might be spent, where the work of your daily life might be done, and where all the while you might be enjoying unbroken communion with himself. Again, Andrew Murray. So, I need to ask some questions tonight. Are you in need of some pruning in your life, but you're running away? Have you taken on so much for the kingdom that you feel like you're drowning? Are there areas of your life that are keeping you from bearing much fruit? Are you abiding in the vine or are you trying to tear yourself off? 
do you want to abide more deeply in the vine? If God has spoken to you in any way, the altars are open. And Paul, could you come and play, please? <laughs> Anybody remember the words? I am divine, you are the branches. <laughs> Keith, Keith Green. Anybody remember Keith Green? Oh, yeah. Yes. yes. Oh, it was good. All the stuff was good. Lord, we thank you that you have called us to be part of you. Oh. That you allow your Holy Spirit to move through us, living energy, Ooh. and you allow it to flow through us to others, <laughs> that we would be a fruit for you. Mm. Lord, help us to do a good job on it. Mm. Amen. Oh, yeah.